Aloha, I'm Malia Zimmerman, and this is News Behind the News. In 2011 and 2012, one of the hot topics is going to be who's going to be our next U.S. Senator. Senator Akaka is going to be retiring, and who's going to replace him? Well, today I have on the only person who's actually declared that he's going to run for U.S. Senate, Ed Case. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. Well, the last time you were on the show, which was not too long ago, um, I tried to get you to declare on the show that you were going to run, <laughs> and you didn't do it. Well, I'm sorry that I wasn't quite ready to do it, but <laughs> I told you that uh, if we did declare, I'd be back on, and here we are. So. There you go. Okay, uh, so you're no. the only one in a field of what we expect to be many people possibly running. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure about that quite yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, there are many other people that are interested in running, and they're all uh, out there actively trying to figure out whether to run, uh, both on the Democrat and the Republican side. Um, and, you know, a U.S. Senate race is a crucial race, not just for Hawaii, but for our country. And we're coming down to really a, a point of, of no return for those candidacies uh, because you really do need a full year plus to actually uh, raise the money to run and to uh, organize to run and to actually run. Speaking so of money, okay, Senator Inouye has talked about it takes $3 million to run for U.S. Senate. Do you think that's a good figure? Um, I, unfortunately, I think that is yes for Hawaii. I think that this is going to be a very expensive uh, Senate campaign. And, of course, we're going to probably have uh, a, a contested primary, and, of course, we will have a contested general. Uh, so I think you could probably split it up and say that there will be a certain amount of money required in the primary. And then, of course, I think the general is going to be very, very expensive. I think the primary uh, is going to be expensive enough, but uh, when you get into the general, uh, one thing that we don't really realize here is that uh, that this is just as important a Senate race as anywhere else in the country. We have 33 Senate races up throughout the country. Uh, many, many crucial key swing uh, Senate uh, districts, uh, states out there. and. Um, in many ways, at that point, the general becomes partly about Hawaii and partly about the country. And so we will see, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of uh, money from outside of Hawaii uh, that's going to be spent in money, especially in the general. I think we saw that in the last congressional race between Colleen Hanabusa and Charles Zhu, where there was a lot of national interest coming in to try to get that seat because it was a very important race, actually nationally. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, across the country, we have... Virginia, New Mexico, um, as important states, and, and the media is paying attention to that. But what about Hawaii? Well, you know, the, 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 the campaign in Hawaii, the candidacy in Hawaii, certainly my candidacy in Hawaii, is about uh, a really a better way of doing things in Washington, D.C. And I think that, again, going back to what I said earlier, I think we have to recognize that on one level this campaign and the decision for the voters uh, on the U.S. Senate in 2012 is a, is a crucial decision for us to make for Hawaii itself. Uh, Senator Akaka has, uh, has served uh, long and well in, in the United States uh, Senate. Uh, Senator Inouye, of course, the dean of the Senate. Uh, uh, but I think we can uh, foresee that his career will come to an end uh, sometime relatively soon. And this is about uh, who can step into Senator Akaka's shoes in a time of transition, who can serve all of the people of Hawaii best, who has the combination of experience and knowledge uh, uh, and, and uh, um, drive to serve Hawaii well. Uh, in the United States Senate to make sure that uh, the issues that the Hawaii is uh, faced with, specific issues to Hawaii, whether it be tourism or military or, or uh, our specific economy here, uh, federal spending here, are, are wisely addressed in Washington. Uh, on a whole nother level, uh, this is one of 100 United States senators, and it's an opportunity for the people of Hawaii to say where they want to take their country. Because I don't think any of us, uh, well, maybe one or two think everything is okay back in uh, D.C., but I don't think that's many of us. I certainly am not one of them. I, I, th I think the political culture of, of Washington is just broken right now. Uh, extreme partisanship, uh, fighting, not addressing the issues, avoidance of the issues. Uh, and I think that really um, one of the huge issues for our country, and I hope it comes through, and I believe it's going to come through in all of these Senate races, and by the way, of course, in the presidential race, uh, is a real focus on, on a different way of governing, uh, a problem-solving way of governing, a, a bridging differences way of governing. Uh, for example, we have a very good uh, example going on in, in the United States Senate right now, the so-called Gang of Six, uh, who are trying to address uh, really the big picture issues having to do with our federal budget to try to solve the budget uh, and deficit over time. We've got competing, uh, quite partisan views from, from the Democrats in Congress and, of course, uh, and Obama and from the Republicans in Congress. And I don't think uh, that that's really going to be the path to be taken in order to solve the deficit. And yet you've got three Republican senators and three Democratic senators, U.S. senators, who have decided 
that they're just going to kind of take matters into their own hands, sit down, very, very competent, capable people, and they're going to try and figure it out and advocate for it. I think that's what's going to take. And I think that and hope that the, that, that the American people in the in the judgments that each of us are going to make in our states in those U.S. Senate races is going to send that message. I think a lot of times Hawaii is taken lightly, but when you look at who's come from Hawaii, for goodness sakes, you have President Obama, you have Senator Inouye in charge of appropriations. He's so powerful. He's third in line, third in line to the presidency. Um, and you have uh, even Governor Neil Abercrombie, when he was in Congress, was on... Uh, you know, veterans affairs. And um, of course, we can't forget he was on the gym committee. <laughs> That's also very important. But we had we did have some very important people coming here and Senator Kaka being in charge of veterans affairs. So um, well, and, uh, that, that it's a very good point to make. And yeah. and I think that, you know, I, I really think that they're, first of all, they're having served in Washington for four years. I think that you do start with a little bit of a perception in Washington uh, that uh, somehow you're you're exotic and unique, and and maybe you don't really understand how the country works, and um, I I found that um, I needed to dispel that pretty darn fast. On an, and I and I and I, in fairness to my colleagues in Congress, uh, it was easy to dispel once you got through it. Uh, you just kind of dug in and did your homework. If anything, I think that uh, when you're from Hawaii and you're in Washington, you you kind of have to try harder, if I can put it that way, because there are certain prejudices that you have to overcome pretty much right away. And I think it causes you to do a better job. I know that I, I know that it motivated me because I felt that I had to prove something not just for myself but for Hawaii. It's like, hey, don't take us for granted just because we live in the best place in the entire <laughs> you know world. And you know, no, I don't uh, you know live in a grass shack and all that kind of stuff. And I think that. Um, I think also that on, on, on many occasions, uh, I, I think it's true, unfortunately, that we, we do tend to uh, perceive ourselves sometimes as operating on a lower standard uh, than the rest of the country uh, in terms of, uh, of our abilities and our capabilities of bringing solutions to national issues. And that is absolutely wrong, as you've pointed out, just the people that we've produced and have done, have done well there. And so I think we have and can continue to add leadership to our country. There is no reason why Hawaii can't continue to project our own unique way of going about things and solving problems for that matter uh, into the national scene. I certainly hope to do that. I'm not going up to, uh, not trying to go up to the United States Senate to, you know, just uh, sit around and deal with local issues. I think this is our opportunity again to contribute to the national uh, debate and to contribute on the national level to national solutions. Okay, I have two questions before we get into issues, and then I want to just hit them as quickly. But um, okay, one question is the recent polls. There's been four recent polls, um, and I think some of them have become public. What do they show in a summary? They show me uh, at this point, at least, uh, doing best among the Democrats in a primary election and doing best among the Democrats against. Uh, uh, Governor Lingle, who I presume is going to be the Republican uh, uh, nominee. That's basically what they show. And I would also add the caveat that those are polls today. <laughs> polls don't polls matter. Are, what, what are polls those are things polls. you can't get into the trap? No, you, you, you can't. And, yeah. and you know, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm happy that, I, I, I am happy that uh, we, we have a very good position uh, uh, going into the race. On the other hand, uh, I never want to lose that edge that that I always felt when we were behind in the polls and were the, you know, clearly the underdog. And I feel that we are the underdogs. Uh, that's my personal perception here. So, uh, you know, the polls are great, but uh, that's what they are. Okay, I wouldn't be a very good journalist unless I asked you this, so I have to ask. When you, last time you were on the show, you were, t you were talking about Senator Inouye and if he was going to be picking somebody and running for Senate, and that in the past you've had conflicts with him because of Senator Kaka. And then right after that, you guys had a kiss and make up session. Why didn't you have that before my show? <laughs> well, I'm really sorry, but you know, believe it or not, I don't I orient everything I'm doing around my, <laughs> I'm my, I'm my just schedule. Around. <laughs> but what about this kiss and makeup session? Can you give the the highlights that are public? Well, uh, first of all, I have said uh, what occurred in that. Uh, so there's nothing. There was no secret discussion here. Yeah. There that that uh, you know somehow was you know a sub rosa part of our discussion. Uh, and I've said very publicly what happened. And so has he, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I felt uh, obviously uh, Senator Inouye did not want me to run for the U.S. Senate in 2006, and I didn't against ask Senator Kaka. against Senator Kaka. Kaka right. And I didn't go to him and say, "Can I run against Senator Kaka?" I announced my candidacy. The voters had a decision to make, and they made it. Uh, and uh, so I think that, um, but Senator Inouye uh, took offense at that uh, and, and felt, 
it was um, not the right thing to do. And I think that, uh, you know, I have to recognize as a practical matter that uh, I'm going up there to be a partner of, of Senator Daniel Inouye, a, a leader of our country, and I intend to be a junior partner to Senator Inouye, and I think that going into the campaign, I felt that it was uh, the right thing to do to go to him, uh, to, to apologize for, for any offense that he took at my candidacy, uh, and to um, basically ask for a start, and to perhaps let him size me up as, as his uh, junior partner. And we had a very constructive uh, and uh, interesting um, and fascinating discussion. So uh, it seemed like he forgave you, but then in an interview right after that, he kind of said, well, he, sa he said something kind of like, well, I wasn't the one, something about cruci crucified or something. I don't know, that should be crucified or something like that. But I didn't. I, I, didn't really, I didn't understand the. I didn't the, really understand the yeah, thing. Um, if that meant you were supposed to be crucified, or or <laughs> what he meant. But I, what, I don't what know. do you, I have to ask him? But um, what do you feel now? I mean, do you really feel like you made up? Well, I think I think it was definitely a good start. I mean, you got to start somewhere. First of all, um, I think I think that um, you know I felt it was important to make the effort, and I felt it was important to step forward and 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 try to cross that bridge. And, and um, I, I felt that. Like I said earlier, it was the right thing to do. I feel very good about having done it. Um, you know. And how long did the whole thing last? I think we talked for like 45 minutes. Oh, that's uh, pretty good. No, we had a very, very uh, good, solid discussion uh, here in Hawaii. And, uh, and he's pledged to stay out of the race. That's right. For Senate. He, 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 has, uh, he has said that he's going to uh, you know, remain neutral in the, in the Democratic primary. Um, he, he has also said that he's going to support the Democratic nominee against Governor Lingle, and if I'm the Democratic nominee, he's going to be supporting me. Um, so that's, that's his perspective, and, and I take him at his word. So I think that, uh, and, and by the way, so as Senator Akaka has said, has said the same thing, that he intends to uh, remain neutral and believes uh, that this is up to the voters uh, to choose. And so I think, um, again, I don't know uh, which Democrat um, is or isn't going to get in to this race, but I think it's going to be a, uh, I presume somebody is going to get into the race other than me. I think it's going to be a fascinating uh, primary. I think it's, uh, I think, I think it's going to present a great choice uh, to the voters. And of course, uh, that'll be most of the voters, probably about 90% of the voters will vote in the Democratic primary next year. So are you surprised no one else has declared besides you? Um, somewhat, I think, but I, on the other hand, uh, each of the people that, uh, uh, is considering running has a very, very difficult choice. I mean, uh, Congresswomen uh, Hirono and Hanabusa, they need to ask themselves whether they believe they have a realistic chance at winning uh, in either the primary or the general. I presume I'm assessing that right now. I don't presume it, I know it, uh, because I you know, hear back from people that go to their meetings. Um, I think that um, we have to remember that for them, the challenge is that they are in US House seats that are only two years. And they cannot run for a U.S. House and run for the U.S. Senate at the same time. They have to make a choice. So if they lose the Senate, they, they leave Washington. And this is a, a little different world, for example, from uh, um, Congresswoman uh, Hanabuso, who's always been able to run mid-Hawaii mid Senate term without losing her seat. So, you know, no real risk there. Um, they have that choice. I think um, you know, former Mayor Hanneman um, has to ask himself the same thing. And he's got a... Uh, you know, a good, solid job right now with the uh, Hawaii Hotel Association, and he can't do that and run at the same time. Uh, the others, um, I think, I think also have their their tough choice. So, in some ways, um, my choice was actually <laughs> the easiest, and I, and I felt it important also to 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 make it uh, because, um, you know, frankly, there's just nothing worse than kind of having one foot in and one foot out. Uh, either get in or get out. And that's that's kind of my attitude. Yeah. Okay. Well. You were very controversial in your own party because you supported um, the troops during um, in Afghanistan when a lot of people were calling from them to come home. You you said it was important to, to fulfill the commitment there um, to co continue the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and um, you you did take a lot of criticism for that and also for your position on Iraq, which you can give more details on. But what? Do you think now that Ob Os oh, Osama bin Laden has been caught? What do you feel vindicated? I don't. I don't. I, that thought never crossed my mind since I learned that Osama bin Laden had been uh, killed. Uh, that that was not 
thing that ever occurred to me. What occurred to me was, uh, first of all, uh, incredible relief, uh, gratitude to uh, the special forces that carried it out, and um, really to to countless uh, people that never gave up on on the, the hunt and uh, the, the fight, really, to, to find him and, and to kill him. Uh, and I think that um, most of those names are never going to be known because they're in the intelligence community. It's not like the it's not like the special forces are going to release the names of the, the people that went on that raid. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they can't. I mean, they they would be targets for the rest of their lives. Uh, but two presidencies, Presidents Bush and President Obama, carried that with them. They both deserve credit for it. Um, and so my first reaction, and my wife Audrey, as you know, is a a um, United Airlines flight attendant. She was actually on a plane to uh, Narita when it all happened, and, and I and uh, I, t I, I, I talked to her this morning, and she said when they landed and found out, they were just all so relieved. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, they lost colleagues uh, on United and other attendant uh, pilots uh, on those planes, as well as a lot of other people. I think the second thought, which is important for us to say pretty straight up, is that. Um, this is a major advance, but it's not the end of the road whatsoever. Um, we're still in Afghanistan. We are still dealing with al-Qaeda. They are still led by some very dangerous uh, people. Um, they still exist. There is still a radical, uh, murderous uh, side of, 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 of that part of the world that wants to kill us and will if they can. And that hasn't, that hasn't gone away. So. I think that we have to um, be sure that we don't let our defenses down now. Well, this is a dangerous time. Incredible um, um, change happening in the Middle East and in the Arab world, the Muslim world. And we've got to be very careful with how we handle all of that. Uh, the opportunities are tremendous right now, even, when, even from when I was in Congress and when I did travel to Iraq and Afghanistan to see for myself, because I think that's probably what a congressman should do when you're making decisions. Things are radically different, um, even in those uh, few years. So, um, I do feel that the uh, positions I took uh, when I was in Congress, for which I, as you correctly uh, pointed out, uh, was um, very much um, criticized, especially by some members of my own party, and it was a major issue in the 06 uh, campaign. I believe that those were the right decisions in retrospect. Uh, I said in 06, uh, at the time, uh, there was a number of uh, people in our country who wanted a, a firm withdrawal date from um, Iraq. I felt that that was a mistake, that it would not uh, be in our interest over the long run. I feel that that was the right uh, decision. And that was actually the decision that we ended up making. President Obama made that decision. I agreed with him. In Afghanistan, I felt uh, strongly that um, uh, we needed to um, remain there, uh, we, and we could not depart Afghanistan because of the consequences both there and in Pakistan and in Iran uh, and uh, throughout uh, uh, that part of the world uh, without uh, risking ourselves and our allies and friends and, and human beings um, all over the world um, too much. And I think that that was the right decision. Of course, we still have a very major um, challenge there. but. Um, Today, uh, a day after, uh, as we film this, after Osama bin Laden was killed, is a better day than yesterday. When you were in Congress, um, I remember visiting you, and one of your big issues was, actually I visited you and Audrey at, in Congress when you were there. Um, one of the big issues you were talking about um, that you also took criticism for, but you remember the blue dogs, the moderates, right? And uh, one of the issues you always uh, pounded on was spending. Too much spending, um, and now look where we are. How, how, I mean, give give an overall picture, and why do you? What do you think in terms of is that the biggest issue the country's facing right now? Is that bigger than our foreign policy? I think there's three big issues for our country today, and I'm not going to rank them, uh, but they are all equally important. First, the first issue, and they're all tied together, by the way. So let's not pretend that we have like three silos going here. First is obviously the economy and jobs. We are not in good shape yet, and we need to focus on recovering an economy and creating and providing jobs. Um, no question about it. The second is our foreign policy. Uh, we have to continue uh, to work with the rest of the world. We cannot become isolationism, isolationists, and you know, bring our borders in. You know, bring up the gangplank and just live in this magical little world. And it's not going to work. Uh, it, for how, all kinds of reasons, militarily, economically, financially, socially, environmentally. 
Um, and the third is uh, the fiscal condition of our country, which has, um, in the last decade, so that spans two presidencies, completely deteriorated from a balanced budget uh, at the beginning of the last decade uh, to today. And that was uh, something that I spoke to um, as a Blue Dog, and the Blue Dogs were a group that focused on uh, fiscal responsibility, fiscal integrity. Um, there were uh, Republicans at the time uh, that um, also cared about that, uh, but in all honesty, um, uh, really, that was all drowned out in this partisan uh, debate and, frankly, um, avoidance of the real challenges. And the challenges are pretty direct. Uh, you got to balance his taxes and spending, so you can't go around like increasing spending and reducing taxes at the same time without expecting some incredible consequence, which is what actually happened. Uh, I feel vindicated in this sense that um, in those years, and those years were 02 to 07, I really felt like I was, uh, uh, you know, screaming in the wind on those issues. That everybody said, "Ah, no." And the president himself, President Bush, said, "You know, the deficit is not." Remember the famous. Quote, I can't, I can't forget it from about 03. Deficits, you know, we don't have to worry about deficits. It's all going to sell itself. I thought it was wrong then, and obviously it did turn out to be wrong. He was no Ronald Reagan, that's for sure. Uh, he was, he was, he was <laughs> not a fiscal... Uh, he was a spender. He was not a fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, but that, them's the facts. Yeah. So I think, I think that... Um, and, and so, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I'm sorry that... I'm sorry that our finances had to deteriorate so badly for, for this to actually elevate in the public consciousness up to the top rung of our, of our issues. But on the other hand, and I wish we had just addressed it then, because um, it, it's always harder to dig yourself out of a deeper puka, as, as we all know. So if you see the puka, just cap it and try to get back out rather than keep on going down. But And there were definitely voices out there talking about spending. Congressman Jeff Flake, I met him from Arizona. He was big on that. Mm -hmm. He was constantly doing challenges. Um, Ron, uh, Congressman um, Ron Paul right. from Texas. That's mm -hmm. a big issue for him. So, the, But it just wasn't a synergy. I mean, then, and then something kind of turned around this last election where people said, hey, we're really worried about this. And the Tea Party sprung up and, and things started changing. So how, what kind of landscape is there now? I mean, are people going to forget about it, or is everybody just going to go back to the way they were, or do we have, we still have a big problem and people should be worried? We have a huge problem and people should be very worried. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, with, with, with uh, you know, national debt at 14 trillion and climbing, um, and the, the real challenges, uh, and I think that, um, I think the people that are, being the most honest about this discussion in Washington, recognize that really the challenges, the most difficult issues, the most difficult solutions, don't necessarily lie on the so-called discretionary, the day, the year-to-year -year discretionary spending. Uh, they lie in 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 the entitlement programs. Uh, so by entitlement, I mean uh, programs that that go on from year to year uh, on certain understandings and certain means of financing that are unsustainable over time. And I'm talking about the big ones, Social Security, Medicare, um, um, pensions. What is going on in much of the country in terms of, 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 of physical concern, including right here in Hawaii, where we have a major problem with the, the employee's retirement system, which is being addressed as we speak. I'm not sure if it well. will get addressed, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah um, or states like Wisconsin, and I'm not going to mm -hmm. judge who's right or wrong in Wisconsin. I'm just going to say, and California, which has, it just has an incredible uh, problem, mm -hmm. um, take those concerns, the ones you feel here at home uh, in, in the city, city and county of Honolulu or the state, and think about them as being magnified an incredible amount. That's what's going on in Washington. and uh, that's Well, just in Hawaii, for example, we have what some studies have said up to $19 billion um, unfunded liability for our state pension, for our retirement system. And when you think about just our whole operating budget for the year, this year coming up, and the next year, it's about $11 billion. So that's, that's two years of operating, basically, almost two years of, of operating budget for the state to try to make up. That's not possible. I don't know how they're going to do it. Well, I don't think that. I first of all, I, I don't. I first of all, it is a huge problem. Second of all, I don't want to pretend that there aren't solutions. Uh, that you know somehow we have to throw up our hands and 
you know, all, you know, go yeah, into the, no, go I mean, into the ocean and solutions. paddle for the horizon or no, anything no, 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 like no, that. No, 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 no. There's definitely solutions, but it's a serious problem. But they are tough. Problem. They right. are tough uh, solutions. Right. Uh, and as we speak here in Hawaii, just as an example, we are basically saying that um, state employees um, that come into the system now are not going to have the same level of pension expectation from the state as state employees that have now retired. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a phasing. Exactly. Also, there's a big issue about rate of return, and all this time they've been saying there's going to be an 8% rate of return, and they've been, they've been kind of using that figure where a lot of people are saying, who gets an 8% return, and maybe it should be 3%, 4%. So I think there's going to be a big reality check up soon with our pension. I think we're kind of in the middle of seeing that, well, and when that's I was going in, across the country. That, that's true across the country. It's true, it's true in our federal government, too, because we make certain assumptions uh, in, in our entitlement programs at the federal level on revenue. Mm -hmm. So that's what a rate, you know, rate of return adds in on the, on the, on the revenue side of it. Uh, you know, for example, in Social Security, uh, we assume a certain birth rate in our country because people that are born today become workers in you know, a couple of decades and they contribute for a number of decades. And this is a pay as you go system, Social Security. Pay as you go. So money coming in now is, is, is applied today to the benefits of the people that are, that are already gaining those benefits. Now, if our birth rate is, is declining and we've assumed an increasing birth rate in Social Security, well, we have a problem there. And that's exactly what has happened with Social Security because our birth rate is going down. Same thing right here in Hawaii. If you if you have a certain rate of return, you've got to be really careful with those rates of return. The real um, challenge on the rates of return is to is to is to be not too aggressive and not too conservative to try to get it just right. Personally, I favor being a little more conservative. Well, look at this long list of questions I have to ask you, and I only have 30 seconds left. Um, okay, so one of the things I wanted to ask you was about um, this big issue, real quick, about pork or um, I, what was the other term for it? Earmark. And Hawaii's, you know, they've, they've cut, uh, stopped, supposedly stopped earmarks, which I can't imagine happening. But anyway, how, well, how's, how's Hawaii going to survive? Well, we're going to work a lot smarter with the federal government, first of all, and we do, we, we do need to wean ourselves off. I don't mind a little bit of earmarking, but obviously it got away from us. Okay, we're going to have to do another show. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Ed Case, the only Senate candidate so far. Um, this has been News Behind the News. I look forward to having more people on the show and maybe a debate in the future. Thank you for joining us. Aloha.